I will be speaking in English, but I can take your questions in the two official languages. Mission with a submission that figured prominently in the final report released in June 2022. In invoking the EA is symptomatic of deficiencies and shortcomings reported by the Cullen Commission. Uh, I also published a recent book on intelligence as democratic statecraft across the five eyes countries that includes substantial information on financial intelligence and have a forthcoming book uh, on financial crime in Canada. So let's look at the typology here. This was not money laundering or tax evasion. The phenomenon that we have is probably closest to terrorist financing. There was an immediate use value to funds provided. The purpose for which those funds were provided was ambiguous. It wasn't clear whether they were being withdrawn for legal or illegal purposes. Um, and um, small donations can have a relatively large impact. And in this case can also serve as a proxy for the extent of public support. So let's think about this. A G7 country with the world's 10th largest economy had to invoke the EA in part to get a handle on some crowdfunding that was in part sustaining some illegal activity. What does this tell us about the adequacy, effectiveness, and efficiency of Canada's financial regime? Within Canada, money laundering is currently governed by 15 different laws and regulatory instruments. At the federal level, Canada currently has 12 agencies tasked with AML enforcement and prosecution, while there are approximately 14 within each province. In February, this sizable financial crime policing apparatus was unable to achieve the necessary strategic effect without the EA. That casts a long shadow over the purported efficacy of laws, regulations, and agencies. And although Canada's system appears quite robust, it is actually very weak. So weak, in fact, that Transparency International has ranked Canada at the bottom of G27 countries, of G20 countries. What are the implications? First, the inadequacy of legislation, regulations, and agencies. Key allies can achieve the same strategic effect without invoking emergency measures because their legislation, regulations, and agencies are actually up to date and properly postured and funded. Second implication, the inadequacy of the posture of Canadian agencies. Expert federal agencies and their financial reporting entities couldn't get it done under existing rule of law powers. Third implication, at least a perception, if not a reality, of the unequal, inequitable, idiosyncratic application of the rule of law. That is, crowdfunding played a role in blockades of critical infrastructure and other environmental protests, for instance, that crossed into the line into civil disobedience, illegality, perhaps criminality, including disregard for court injunctions. But no extraordinary measures were taken to stem financial flows to these groups. So the impression, when the government is sympath sympathetic to protesters and their cause, it goes easy on them. When the government is not, it will go to extraordinary lengths to shut them down. That impression, if not the reality, undermines the very premise of constitutional democracy, that the rule of law applies equally to all citizens to thwart precisely what we are witnessing here, the tyranny of the majority. Fourth implication. In February, the Prime Minister wanted foreign money funding illegal protests in Canada to stop. Minister Mendocino has remarked, remarked about the number of contributions and their sheer size. But CIS has testified before this very inquiry that it found no foreign actors funding the protest and told the government that back in February. So, did the government engage in deliberate misinformation on foreign funding anyway? Implication five, compare the prime minister's preoccupation with foreign funding of a relatively small but tenacious protest in Ottawa with this government's inaction 
on Chinese foreign influence in Canadian elections and democratic institutions, Chinese police stations in Canada, and sanctions on Russia. Words in Canada speak louder than action. In the UK, 19 billion uh, pounds in assets have been frozen. In Belgium, 52 billion euros. In Canada, 122 million Canadian dollars. It would appear that dirty Russian money in Canada is not a priority. But 20 million raised over three weeks entirely from Canadian sources for protest by Canadians warrants invoking the EA? There are two ways to read this. The threats to Canadian democracy are as real from within as they are from without, or that it's okay for US, Chinese, and Russian money to interfere with Canada's democratic processes and interests, just not for Canadians with Canadian money, especially if they're opposed to the federal government or its policies. Six implications. Donors came from across Canadian society, including prairie farmers. They've now seen how the government is prepared to go after people and their assets, should they fund a social movement that is opposed to the current government or its policies. The unintended consequence? They've restructured their assets to put them out of reach for government and moved support for controversial social movements online onto cryptocurrency, which makes these financial flows less visible and harder to track. So the EA has had perverse incentives of making work much more difficult for intelligence agencies. The conclusion, was it really worth to invoke the EA? So how did we get here and what does it tell us? First, financial intelligence in this country is embarrassingly weak. FinTrack is an outlier among F... Uh, le canafé est marginal. Il n'a pas de capacité d'enquête, le droit de demander directement de, diffère, de diverses identités des renseignements financiers et le droit de, je, de geler des transactions douteuses. Le CANAF est un type de FIU passif parce qu'il vise les divulgations passives soumises par la police. Le Canada a un rapport de reddition de compte qui est très coûteux pour les banques. On conclut que les organes d'application de la loi de la province ne peuvent pas compter sur le CANAF pour produire des renseignements en temps opportun. Et le renseignement criminel et la posture inadéquate des agences d'exécution de la loi. Il est impossible de suivre la responsabilité. En 2018, par exemple, la GRC a confessé publiquement qu'elle n'avait aucune expertise pour mener des enquêtes sophistiquées sur les entreprises. 86 des accusations portées entre 2012 et 2017 ne se sont jamais rendues devant les tribunaux parce qu'elles ont été retirées ou suspendues. Il y a eu des, de, de très bons exemples en la matière à Vancouver et à Toronto. En 2020, la GRC a dissous sa division en Ontario parce que les priorités ont changé. Ensuite, les lois faibles. Un exemple. Depuis au moins 2002, on a recommandé que le gouvernement adopte des lois. Obtain and disclose information concerning client billings to government regulators. The step is thought to be necessary to guard against the use of lawyers as willing or unwilling dupes who are being paid with crooked dollars. In peer reviews, FADF has highlighted the ongoing non-compliance by two countries that refuse to abide by the disclosure recommendation, Canada and the United States. Fourth, weak penalties. For instance, KPMG, one of the world's big four accounting firms, had set up an aggressive tax plan that they marketed to high net worth individuals who lived mainly in British Columbia. In March 2016, the CBC published reports that indicated the CRA had entered into overly generous settlement agreements with taxpayers. One unhappy taxpayer went to the media with their complaints. But part of the controversy surrounded the fact that no sanctions were ever levied against the tax advisors, the accountants, and the lawyers who set up and then marketed the plan in the first place. What does this tell us? that Canadian national security, including financial intelligence, is not fit for purpose for the 21st century. 
What's the government's response? It announces seemingly ambitious, but essentially unquantifiable and vague policy to root out corruption, increase regulatory oversight, tackle the opioid crisis, make housing more affordable for ordinary Canadians. Compare that to the government's determined commitment and response to counterterrorism. By contrast, the EA and Cullen are a measure of the government's inattention to financial crime. How then to explain the disconnect between the Canadian state's avert commitments and its failure to deliver on such commitments? Because there is no political or corporate will. The message is, don't ask, don't tell. Especially the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers findings, as well as the 2020 Tax Justice Network figures, suggest that Canada is not unduly worried about the cleanliness of financial flows, whether from immigration or from investment. There's a mix of activities that are illicit, for example, capital flight and business investment, illicit, for example, white collar crime and tax evasion, and on the fringes of legality, for instance, aggressive tax avoidance and trade related malpractices. Having spent decades building reputation as a haven and global shelter for illicit gains, the government does not have the intent to slaughter its golden goose. Invoking the EA sends a clear message. This is a one-off measure to contain a controversial social movement that is causing the federal government at the time political headaches. Purveyors of dirty foreign money and their enablers need not worry because Canada isn't about to change its regime or its mantra. Canada is still open for dirty money. The Cullen Commission confirmed what we all already knew, that the Canadian financial regime works very well for criminals and the ultra-rich to the detriment of the middle class and everyone else. The message in invoking the EA, if you're a criminal or ultra-rich, you need not worry. In short, the justification for invoking the EA, that instead of building a financial regime that's actually fit for purpose for the 21st century, temporarily invoking the EA was far more expedient. Merci. Thank you.